Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. First of all, yeah, I need to thank uh, the Vistaprint company for making this happen. Uh, to all organizers, uh, thank you for inviting. Uh, so I could share th some thoughts about paradigms, about functional programming, which I'm passionate about. But uh, let's stop talking about me and get acquainted with you. So anyone who considers himself or herself as an object-oriented programmer, raise your hands, please. OK, quite a lot. What about functional programmers? Are there any? Hmm, fewer, but still en enough, yeah. Mm, interesting, interesting. I in do you want to be convinced with that talk even more? I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure if I tell you something really, something new, but let's see, let's see. Uh, let's start from this picture. I, I believe it should be familiar for many of you. And uh, pay attention to the title. It's uh, object-oriented world seen by object-oriented programmer. But is it really that case? What is indoor session initial initializer? Is it really that object? Is it called that way? I thought it's a door. Or multi bot supporter, that's the, the best, I guess. It's a sofa, isn't it? But you know, uh, it doesn't look that unfamiliar for people working in an object-oriented way. So we are used all to all those factories, initializers, managers, controllers, and so on. What about this one? Abstract Toast Heater Generator Factory Interface Implementer. Uh, that's really insane. I hope you never find such thing in a in the real um, a real code. But yeah, sometimes you find something really incredible. So we are so used, and many developers are so used to doing it this way, th with all those namings, with all those strange namings, not really replicating the real world. Um, does anyone know what that means? I have a translation for you. So nothing is more dangerous than an idea when you have only one idea. So if we are doing something on only one way, with one way, uh, I don't know, object-oriented programming with kind of that approach. Uh, if, and there are a lot of people will insist on doing it exactly the same way, all the time, all the time, the same way. And it, may, it will make it consistent, but there is nothing, like, th there is nothing wrong about consistency. There is really something wrong about doing it incorrectly. If you're doing something const constantly wrong, that's bad. We can rephrase that quote a bit closer to our world, and there is uh, nothing is more dangerous than an ID when you have only one ID. Um, I could tell that about Visual Studio. .NET and C-sharp development uh, was always really tightly coupled to Visual Studio. You only had that one ID. Luckily, that's not the case anymore. We have Rider, Visual Studio Code, and it's cross-platform, and that's cool. Uh, we can rephrase it even more. There is nothing is more dangerous than an OO when you have only one object. Remember? Singleton. One global mutable variable, something really strange. And why is it object-oriented then? I believe that's how we should look at object-oriented development, object-oriented programming. So if it's a sofa, then it's a sofa. And if it's a picture, it's not a, um, how's it, a living space separator decorator? No, oh, come on. That's the way of naming things. And as we all know, naming is one of the hardest things in the world of programming in computer science, right? Uh, there is another quote which was funny to me. It is possible to do object-oriented programming in Java. Um, <laughs> not everyone does that still. Uh, but uh, let's not talk about Java. Let's have, uh, let's imagine we have a task to draw 
to draw a circle or an ellipse, uh, we develop our own paint, let's say. And what is a circle? It sounds like a specific kind of uh, ellipses with uh, ellipse with uh, semi major axis, semi minor and major axis equal. So we could think of having an inheritance. So we have an ellipse uh, with two properties. I intentionally put get set there because this is also one of the really common ways of uh, defining the properties. And we have a circle with uh, which in which is derived from from ellipse and has um, yet another property which is radius. But what if we draw and we then want to change it, change just on one axis? So so the circle becomes wider just in one on on the one axis. Why? How? It becomes not a circle. So we cannot do that basically. The thing is that we cannot do it to any object. Just take a piece of paper, a pen, draw a circle, okay, an ellipse, it's easier, and that's it, you cannot change it. So basically, the problem is that once you have the instance of an object, you cannot change, and you should not change that. So this is another way of doing that. So inheritance, yes, again, inheritance. Uh, we can throw uh, exceptions, but still it's not telling us how, how it should work really in this world. So I believe this is the better approach. These two things are completely different things. If it's an ellipse, then it's an ellipse. If it's a circle, then it's a circle. They have nothing in common, but we can possibly convert a circle to an ellipse, to another instance of an ellipse, so kind of copy it. And we all can also know if an ellipse is a circle, if, if the axis, uh, the major and uh, minor are equal. So basically, just because you have a getter doesn't mean you should have a matching setter. Uh, well, uh, you know, um, get and set, these things are, they have definitely uh, some side effect. It sounds really weird, get. If you get something from somewhere, there is an obvious side effect, it, it's, it becomes missing on that place. If you get money from, your, uh, from an ATM, there is an obvious side effect on your bank account. So it's, uh, not, um, it's not safe to have get and set. That's not correct, let's say. Um, Let's get back to an, our ellipse, so get and set properties. What if we try to rethink it and make it immutable at some point? Because, uh, yeah, this is C sharp code. Uh, unfortunately, class is a reference type, it's null, so it can be uh, kind of mutated anyway. But how we create it, so we have just now we have only get, no sets. And we create always new type, not new instance of ellipse type. Functional languages such as F sharp have a better approach to that. They have a special type called record type, and it's just a data type. There are just properties. It's immutable. It's uh, um, it's compared by values, so it's just perfect for data. And yeah, it's immutable. That's how we create it, super simple. And yeah, by the way, we need to pass all uh, properties at the same time. So it's that kind of constructor which takes all parameters at once. But if we want to create a new instance of that, so we just could we could reuse the existing ellipse and change just one property and get yet another instance with uh, something changed. So. Let's get back to our object-oriented programming, which is uh, which. All th these three words: encapsulation, polymorphism, and inheritance, come to my mind when I hear OOP. It's kind of obvious, but we we've seen an, um, just an example with inheritance. That's 
not working well all the time. And from my po uh, from my ex experience, there were a lot of issues when I had to change something in the base class, and that affected all derived classes. So I had to refactor the whole solution. Uh, that's crazy. I prefer composition to that, which is also possible even in object-oriented programming. Polymorphism, uh, yet another thing which tries to treat different things like they are the same, which is also uh, not always working well. But the really important thing is encapsulation, and that could work in any paradigm, and that's really important. But Having something encapsulated must be properly named. Because sometimes we, again, have all those weird names and which don't tell what they really do. Uh, by the way, encapsulation, the common way of doing encapsulation is uh, to introduce some uh, private uh, fields, private methods, and interact with them. Uh, but that's not a real encapsulation because you have ref uh, reflection and you can access all those private fields as well. The real way of doing encapsulation <laughs> is to use local function. You won't be able to access that. But that's, yeah, just a side. Uh, let's get back to naming. A classic example, create connection. A method which creates connection. What does that actually mean, create a connection? I don't want to create a connection to anything. Uh, from a connection provider or to a connection provider. I don't know what, what that would mean. I want to connect to something. So why won't we just name it connect to provider of updates? Just that's it and get some, yeah, of course it will give you some connection back, but how? Like, let's name the things as they are. Let's stop using those uh, verbos, those uh, suffixes, all those factories and so on, we don't really need them. Let's stop making all those workarounds and name the things that they're really called. The problem here is that basically not object-oriented versus functional, which I'm going to talk about later. It's more about imperative versus declarative. Because object-oriented, we in functional programming also deal with objects. With of course there are objects. If it's a, I don't know a user entity coming from a database or from I don't know an API, uh, it comes as it is, and we cannot change it. Why would we have get and set? So we just have gets, and that's fine. That should be enough. If we want to create another entity, we just uh, create it. That's an, another instance. And we do the same in functional programming too, but we do it a bit differently. Imperative means giving some comments to the computer and tell, them, tell it, do that, 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 in this order, and change some global or at least shared state. And with declarative, you do it another way. So let's have an example, let's see. We have uh, an array of uh, numbers, that's pretty simple, and we want to sort it. Uh, that's JavaScript and that would work. I mean, sort and it will sort it in place. So the original, uh, original array will be changed, will, will be updated. If you have so many updates of some global state from different parts of real application, the more you have, the more you need to juggle them. That's just like the, the correct order of updating the state and then expect something to be there and remember concurrency when you need to do it from different threads. That's, that's hard. And this is declarative way. So we don't give a common to a computer we just ask, what if that array will be sorted? How would that look like? If we pass an array to that function, it will give us a new array. Not the same one, it won't change it, it will give you the another array. 
You might say that it's inefficient. Like, why? How? It's a, it's, it's a new array. How much memory you need to just imagine a huge collection? But that doesn't work exactly this way. We will see how, how exactly it works later on. It won't be a, just a new array. Uh, it will be just yeah, a new array, but the values will be the same on the same places in the memory. Uh, let's see. Excel is the world's most popular functional uh, language. Uh, that's how Simon Peyton Jones thinks. And I would agree with him because imagine Excel is just a formula in, a f in one cell. If you put something in, the, in another cell, you get uh, another, uh, the, the first cell updated and that's it. There is, nothing, there is no state. There is no need to mutate any state and give any command to anywhere. And it's closer to math, mathematical way of formula of a function. And in math, there is no state. In math, if it's a function, it's an expression, yeah, f of x or f of x of y of z, whatever. It just gives you the same result with this, uh, for the same incoming argument. So it's a it's always pure, and you get, uh, there are no side effects, no global state, no shared state is updated, nothing happens. And then you, you a lot of bugs are actually happening just, just due to uh, accident, accidentally updating some, some state, some global state. From the Haskell website, Haskell is considered as the pure functional language. It doesn't have any side effect in the language at all. Uh, that might sound strange because any application has a side effect. I don't know if a pixel uh, is, uh, is, if your screen is uh, lighting, then it's, it must be some side effect. There is heat in the processor, there is side effect. How come? But uh, Haskell is doing it a bit differently. Uh, it uh, shifts all that responsibility to the runtime. So it just it describes how the application should work when it is run in the runtime. Different runtime, I don't care. The runtime will, will make all those side effects. But Haskell doesn't. Yeah, in functional programming, programs are executed by evaluating expressions in contrast with imperative programming where programs are composed of statements which change global states when executed. And functional programming typically avoids mutable state. Uh, not always the case, but yes, that's how we try to do and that eliminates a lot of bugs. Uh, because, yeah, again, the more, uh, the more global states you have, the, the, more need, the more issues you have with concurrency, with updates, and proper order of those updates. And many programming languages support programming in both functional and imperative style, but the syntax and facilities of a language are typically optimized for only one of these styles. And social factors like coding convention and libraries often force the programmer towards one of the styles. That's a really important thing because let's imagine C sharp or Java. You can work with it not in kind that object oriented way which we're all used to. We can write it almost purely functionally, like declaratively with just static functions, static methods. That's possible. But that's not idiomatic, almost no one does that. Because the social factor is huge. Like a lot of libraries are written in a different way and we're kind of all used to that. So uh, let's uh, talk about functions a bit more. Uh, there is uh, an example in C and JavaScript and C Sharp that's much more like much heavier synthetically. Uh, C-sharp is a really verbose language. I guess it would be the same in Java, or pretty much the same. And that's how it looks like in a functional language. That's Erlang. Uh, 
There is no type annotation you could notice uh, because Erlang is a dynamically typed language. Even in functional world, we also al also have all those debates. Dynamically or statically typed languages are the best. Yeah, so Erlang uh, doesn't need that. Haskell, by the way, doesn't need it either. So this is Haskell, and it's statically typed. It's statically typed, but there is no you know, annotation, like there is no need to annotate with types. You can actually, if you would, if you yes, if you want, please do. That's not a problem. Uh, it takes an int and returns an int. That's it. Pretty simple. Uh, by the way, Haskell has nice type, which is int, I believe, or integer, which takes the whole memory which you have. It's not fixed to four or eight bytes, whatever, it's just the whole memory. So imagine how big numbers you can get on 32 gigs, for example. A part of pro objects, so the real world objects, we also deal a lot with, with collections of those objects. We iterate through them a lot. And how do we do that in imperative style? With loops, of course. Do for each for a while. Uh, that's pretty familiar thing for everyone, I guess. Uh, but it turns out that in many languages, especially functional languages, all those iterations are already done for you inside the language. You don't need to write loops anymore. And the alternative to loops is recursion, of course. Uh, does anyone know the, the most famous uh, recursive function? The, the, the most famous thing which needs recursion? Factorial, yes, of course. That's factorial. And this is the imperative way of implementing it. That's pretty simple. Let's go functional. Uh, not really convincing, right? That's uh, the same amount of lines and what what what's next? That yeah, it's recursion, whatever. I can do it a bit shorter, still the same amount of lines. And by the way, by the way, here we will get uh, Stack Overflow exception, right? Because uh, there is no it's JavaScript and there is no tail call optimization. So we need to implement something like this, and still still it's far from being like better than imperative way. But uh, what actually a factorial is, uh, it's, uh, we can describe it with this formula. Uh, so for one, the factorial is zero. Uh, oh, for zero, <laughs> factorial is one, sorry. Um, but for any number greater than zero, it's n multiplied by n minus one factorial. That's one way of describing it, but that's another way of describing it with a product. So basically the product of all the elements, right? That's how it would look like in Haskell. And product is the real uh, function built in, in Haskell. Like, that's it. You don't need anything else. You pass n, we create a list from 1 to n, and we product all those elements together. Uh, this is another way of implementing factorial, and this one is actually great because fold L, which is fold left, so from the right to left, uh, it takes three arguments, a function which needs to be, uh, which it uses to fold the elements in the list and some initial state. The initial state is one, so even if we pass zero, then we basically don't have any list. We just have an initial uh, value one, which is a perfect, perfectly valid value for factorial of zero. So it just takes all elements, takes one, multiplies, like folds it with applying the function multiply. Yeah, by the way, in Haskell and uh, other functional languages, even in F-sharp, for example, uh, 
everything is an expression, even the operator. So that's a function which actually takes two parameters, uh, just a and b, and multiplies them. So uh, that's how it works. The last element, the previous element, multiply together, uh, multiply the result to the previous element, and so on to till till the the first one. It's pretty simple, and it's really easy to reason about that. Uh, and there is no mutation of state, there is no intermediate variables, nothing like that. It's just once you pass n, it's folded. The, the, uh, the, the whole list is folded to the left. Uh, yeah, there is fold left, fold right, which is important maybe not for multiplication, but for minus and plus it could be a big difference, especially for minus or divide uh, by something you can... If you do it from the left or from to the from the right, we will get different result, of course. Let's talk about lambdas. Um, lambda. What is a lambda? Lambda is actually a, a value. Uh, a, a some some name uh, some value, which is bounded to an expression with it which appears to be uh, a function. So. Basically, that's a way of passing functions. Uh, this is a notation you know, from Lambda Calculus, and that was the first object-oriented language even in uh, 1930s. Um, uh, this is the explanation from Haskell. The higher order f a higher order function is a function that takes other functions as arguments, returns the functions, or returns a function as a result. So if we pass a lambda somewhere, that function is obviously a higher order function. And this is nothing like new or unique. Uh, it's, it was actually uh, already implemented even in ALGO 68. Back then, there were procedures from starting begin and end, and you could pass them around, and everyone was saying, oh, no, you don't do that. No, not yet. Or, I don't know, that's not the way. Uh, but yeah, now I guess uh, almost every language has lambdas, and uh, even C++ got them in 2011 uh, compared to Algol 68. Yeah. Uh, so this is the way of uh, describing a lambda in JavaScript. In the more modern JavaScript, it would look uh, better, and pretty much the same in Haskell. And we can pass it somewhere, so let's say to a function map, uh, which takes a function applied to each element of the collection and returns a new collection with new values. We could pass uh, that lambda just directly without uh, assigning a name to it. And here, yeah, it's basically the same thing. This is the, m the implementation of product function, that one, that product function which we used in factorial. And uh, we also, if you remember, yeah, uh, it's fold right actually, not for left, but for mul multiplication doesn't really matter. Uh, we pass, as I told you, we pass multiply as a function. It's a function as well. But you see, there is, a, there is one argument missing actually. Because fold right, it actually takes three arguments. The function, the initial state, and the array, or list. But there is no such. So we're missing one argument, and that's fine. That's actually fine, since in functional languages, a function is a first-class citizen. It tries to make them as easy to work with as possible, they are neat and short. So if we don't pass all the arguments to that function, it just returns us a new function, expecting just that one last argument. So this is called partial application. And this is the conversion of a polyadic function into a function taking fewer arguments by providing one or more arguments in advance. So he can then combine those functions and compose them as, simp as, as much as you can, as, as you wish. Like that's really a powerful way of composing your application instead of applying every time the function to some value, to some state and mutate it. 
Uh, this is uh, how it would look like. So if uh, it's a function applied to, to x called h, then g to the result of that execution, and then f. Uh, this is how we write it uh, in a better way. It's a composition sign. Uh, by the way, this is a perfectly valid Haskell code, but uh, you usually don't do that. There is no compose symbol on the keyboard, unfortunately. Uh, so we replace it with dot. That's fine. It also worked the same way. And the application is reversed. So the first, uh, uh, the first function applied to x will be h. And the result of that will be passed to g. And then the result of that execution will be passed to f. Uh, so this way, right? This, yeah, with dot, that's Haskell. And this is F sharp. Uh, you see the direction of that composition, which is really uh, nice. Basically, that composed function will give us another function which just needs one argument, and we pass x to that and get the result of execution of f. And this is the way um, we would do it with another direction. The composition of functions is nothing, again, no, not something really new. We also compose them when we do something like this. So this is uh, some should be familiar for a lot of people, and uh, that's C# -sharp code in Java with streams. It would look pretty much the same with a bit different syntax, but yeah. Uh, and in C# -sharp here it works due to enumerable and the extension function uh, extension methods. And uh, that's pretty simple, and the great thing is it's lazy evaluator. So until you really execute to list or to array, whatever, or to dictionary, I don't know, to, until you materialize that execution, it never happens. So you can do a lot of them until you d really hit the, the computation is not happening, it's not uh, using your CPU. That's the one way of composition functions, which we already use, I hope, and uh, I, I believe that's really good. Uh, there is a bit of a different way of doing that, uh, something like Unix style. So if anyone is familiar with uh, pipe operator in Unix, uh, there is a way of composing, let's say we cat a file, so we take the uh, the content of the file, we pass it to head function, taking seven, uh, seven lines of code, then we pass the result to tail function and take the last five lines. So pretty great thing and really powerful because you can compose them, just you need to make sure that the incoming type fits. So it's used to that new, uh, second, third, whatever, ends function. In uh, F-sharp, there is also a pipe operator, and you can do uh, pretty much the same thing as in C-sharp, but passing exactly to, to a function. That's not so uh, the difference is you don't, uh, you don't do it on the, the same object. You don't call a function or, or method on an object. You just pass the, ex the, the result to another function which is declared in the sec module, that's just sequence, uh, I number all pretty much the same thing. And uh, until you do s list of sec, it's not materialized. Again, it's lazy and uh, works well. Uh, by the way, here you can see also partial application. Exactly what, what means partial application, because sec filter, let's say, takes uh, two arguments, the function and uh, the collection. And uh, this is actually about not mutating state again. That's the, m the main, the key point of this talk, to make as many, uh, as, as, as fewer state updates as possible. Let's look at another example. Let's consider a stack. What is a stack? So we put something on top, on top, on top, on top. We can take the top and we can pop, which removed that top element, and we can, yeah, pushing you know, it adds, and we can check the depth of it. So the implementation of such uh, interface would look something like this. So 
we have uh, some internal collection, the list, and then we have uh, depth, which gives out the count. And then in, three, uh, in two functions, in two methods, we actually have uh, a check, an if check. And we throw some exception, yeah, that's obvious, but that's kind of, we need so many checks, and you know, the more conditions you have, the easier it is to fail with the final logic, and it's easier to make a bug, to produce some bug just for getting s to check something. And obviously, when there is the depth is zero, you cannot take the top element. The stack is empty. That's pretty simple. What if, what if, uh, notice that uh, pop and push return nothing, the void. So they are mutating, so basically they are adding or removing elements from the internal collection from items. And that's again mutating, updating, state, something like that. What if we create another interface? And those methods will have uh, a return value stack. So they don't mutate something, update something, they just return a new stack instead. Then we could implement two different stacks. An empty stack, which always returns zero for depth. That's th th we don't even need to check anything, that's always zero. Uh, yes, we throw exceptions. And uh, we, when we want to push, we return a new non-empty stack. Uh, we will get to the implementation of non-empty stack a bit later. Uh, but consider that if we push something to a stack and we return a new stack, it will always be non-empty. So it doesn't matter it's the initial one is empty or not. Anyway, the resulting will be non-empty. So we can make use of uh, the uh, new C Sharp 8 feature, which is being released right now. There should be a Microsoft event releasing a new version of uh, .NET Core 3 and C Sharp 8, I guess. So this is the default implementation of a method and interface. And uh, yeah, if it's push, it's new non-empty stack uh, with a new top and the previous stack, yeah, that will simplify our empty stack a bit. We we'll remove one function, uh, one, one method from here. And this is the implementation of non-empty stack. So we always have that top element and the tail. And we can always give the top no matter, because we don't need to check anything. It always exists there, because there is only one way to create that non-empty stack is to pass a new top. And also, pop will return the tail. Pretty simple, nothing, to, you know, don't need to create or update or remove anything. And the yeah, uh, recursive way of getting the depth, uh, one plus tail depth, and that will go through down, down to the uh, empty stack, which is zero, uh, which has depth zero. And this is the different ways of uh, using those stacks. So that would be uh, an imperative way of doing that. Just uh, stack, push, that will update the internal state of that stack, and you need to make sure you do it in a proper order. Um, and here, that would be a different approach, since we don't update any state, we just return a new stack all the time. We can uh, chain this, those calls, and actually what we can do is to see the whole history because we can uh, stop at any point and assign variable or value to the new the each stack and it will be mm, collection of like the history of of uh, pushes the thing is uh, that you might say again it's inefficient like <laughs> so many stacks but that's that's not true we will see that the only constraint we have on this stack is that the t must be immutable so if you can change an element in stack that means the stack uh, itself is changed and that's not that's not the way uh, 
persistent data structure, that's what it's called, and it has nothing to do with persistent storage. Uh, it's uh, just the data structure that always preserves the previous version of itself when it's modified. Such data structures are effectively immutable as their operations do not, at least visibly, update the structure in place, but instead always yield a new updated structure. And that's how we can visualize it. So this is uh, stack A, and it, the pointer points to the first element, so this will be our stack A. We can have a stack B pointing to the same thing, so it will be not a copy, it will be the same stack in the memory, the, th the same four elements. And if we do pop on A, we actually don't copy or don't create a new stack anymore. Uh, even even in this case, we just point to another uh, to another um, place in the memory, and that's it. And since it's uh, usually a linked list, there is no problem with that, and we can add more to that. And there will be a D uh, which pushes, and that's it. I uh, don't see any problem here. There it's still efficient because you don't recreate the whole stack from scratch, you just reuse the existing, the tail is always uh, reused. Uh, the same works for actually sorting an array when creating a new array. The elements, the objects will stay the same in the memory, only the pointers will, be dif uh, the, the will have different order. So that's Efficient enough, and nowadays we have really good computing uh, the, the computers, like which I don't know. It's maybe maybe 20 years ago that would be uh, a problem, but now I don't see an issue with that for common business applications. The really the real problem I see in business applications is that we want to make them parallel or we want to make many things at the same time. That's why we introduce concurrency with the use of threads. And the threads usually access some data, some shared data uh, from different threads and we want to make our program safe, so we introduce locks and that actually avoids concurrency, but our goal is to introduce concurrency. So that's kind of strange. Uh, how would we deal with that? Yeah, all computers wait at the same speed. I, I believe all everyone knows, so no matter how powerful it is, if there is a lock and it uh, waits for, uh, for uh, the, the data being unlocked, it will be the same time. So. Let's look at this. The data can be mutable or immutable, and it can be shared or n unshared. And by shared, I mean that if it's being accessed from different threads, at least two. And if we talk about immutable unshared data, so it's just one thread, it's not uh, updated, it's just get of that data all the time from one thread, it doesn't need no any synchronization. So it's simple to work with, you don't care. Uh, even shared immutable data needs no synchronization because uh, if several threads access the same uh, data in memory uh, f just to get it, uh, no problem with that. You don't need to synchronize anything, no locks, nothing like that. Even unshared mutable data needs no, uh, no synchronization because uh, it's one, uh, one thread. If you update and get uh, the data from only one thread, that's pretty simple. That's not a problem. You can do that. There is no need for lock. The only need for lock is when you have something which you need to update from one thread and another thread is trying to get it. And that's the problem of synchronization. That one needs synchronization. Functional programming with all the techniques of declarative way of doing that uh, tries to make everything immutable. 
And even the function itself, it's immutable and uh, it has no side effect. And the composition of that has no side effect until it's being executed by the runtime. So when it's not necessary to change, it is necessary not to change. It's just carry. That's the really, uh, really important thing. We we do so many muta mutations, so many updates of states in object-oriented programming and imperative programming mainly, that we we ex uh, we then produce so many bugs on that. It's better to have a flow in the pipeline and just no update, and that's really easy to test. Imagine a, a function which gives you the same result for, for the same input all the time. Super simple to test how as, as much as possible, uh, as, as many times as possible. Because asking a question should not change the answer. It's, uh, if you s ask um, your function give me the result, it always should give you the same result. So asking a question should not change the answer and nor should asking it twice. Um, yeah, that actually doesn't work with children. Um, I think uh, that's the whole point of this talk. Try to make things immutable and if you don't like the way of doing it in your language, try to consider another language. That's why I encourage you to sign up for the second talk uh, in a month, uh, the 22nd of October. It's about F sharp. We will go through the syntax and uh, the uh, more deep techniques uh, which uh, it allows to do. And uh, then after, after that talk, we will have a workshop about safe stack where we can really apply F sharp on both back end and front end and compare it, uh, combine it in a huge application, whatever you want. Uh, so that will be a workshop uh, in, in on, Saturday, on the first Saturday of November. I would like to give credits to Kevin Heaney. Uh, that's the amazing guy who inspired me uh, about all those things, about functional programming, about the way of thinking a bit differently on naming. And um, yeah, and I hope to see Kevin uh, at some conference soon. I actually took a few flights from him even. Uh, basically, that's it. Uh, which questions do you have? No questions? Uh, that's basically uh, the features of the languages. It's not about functional programming itself. Pattern matching will be introduced in uh, C-sharp, and it's already there, and it's not a functional language. Yeah, it's... Uh, yes, that's the, the different thing, actually. Uh, it's more about uh, algebraic data types, which are used in uh, different languages like, I don't know, F-sharp, Haskell, uh, and their pattern matching works perfectly, and yeah, that's basically the best match. Uh, so it's not mainly about functional programming, it's the way of uh, combi uh, like uh, implementing the logic. And as for monads, uh, that thing actually helps to make state immutable. <laughs> that's also, <laughs> that, uh, my whole point was to tell you that the, the, uh, the less you m update the state, the better it is, and in functional programming, we do it all the time. If you want to know more about deep, uh, deeper techniques like monads and so on, please come to my next talk, and we will do it in, about in F sharp with F sharp's monads. Even though it doesn't have such things as free monad and uh, built in like Haskell, for example. But if you wish, we can go through a bit of Haskell there just to compare. Yeah, it's it's not 
precisely functional. Yeah, of course, it's pre well, monad actually comes from category theory. So it's kind of another area which functional programming is trying to build on top on category theory. But by the way, I need to mention that you don't have to. You don't have to know category theory to work in f with functional languages. Uh, uh, that's why actually I like F sharp, which allows you to just switch the syntax, uh, stay in the mm, familiar .NET world uh, with a different syntax, and then start step by step apply more and more functional techniques you can s use it imperatively but yeah you shouldn't but you can then uh, try to apply some things try to apply pipes try to apply results and other monads and that's th you will be happy that i'm sure about that so yeah it's of course functional programming is more but I wanted to give the main, the main feature, the, the main, the, the kind of, the most important part for me: uh, pure functions and immutability, which actually is kind of the same thing. Yeah. No more questions. Uh, statically or dynamically typed languages? The, the, the yeah, I prefer statically typed languages. And by the way, there is a book, Category Theory for Programmers, by Bartosz. Oh, I forgot the surname. Gigan. Which? Okay, uh, someone. Uh, Someone of you know that book. So uh, in the beginning of that book, there is actually written that imagine uh, a lot of monkeys which randomly type some symbols on the keyboard, and they are producing machine code. And actually, machine code with w will work, the assembly code, it will work in any, like, uh, in any order. You can uh, plus and uh, move and uh, hop, whatever, I don't remember those names, but that's possible. Like, it will, a any uh, program will work, but almost no program will make sense, of course. Uh, with statically typed programming, so if we do, uh, if we ask them to type more uh, with dynamically typed languages, at some point that will actually work. So there will be m still enough happy monkeys which randomly typed something in the network because that's a dynamically typed language, uh, and they, they yeah, for each making sense program they get. Or compiled pro oh yeah compiled program they get a banana something like that, but if we consider statically typed languages there will be almost no monkey which will get the program even compiled. So what do we want? Happy monkeys or good programs? So that's the good question. We, and I choose uh, good programs. So I choose statically typed languages. And in functional programming, there is algebraic data types uh, in F sharp and Haskell. Uh, actually, uh, other languages. Yeah there, yeah, there is another type of languages, of course. There is such thing as, as Lisp. It's, it's also a perfect language, but that's a different way of thinking. It's dynamically typed, right? But it's uh, you can write your own language in it. No, 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 no. Uh, I, I, what, I, what, what I wanted to say there is that uh, you can go back and see how it works. Um, I wanted to, 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 to say that you don't have to, it's not about purity, it's about uh, type inference. So the type of X in that case will be just inferred from the context. Uh, where was that? Yeah, let's say here. So X, any type which can be multiplied will fit here in Haskell. So uh, basically, if you 
next in the next uh, line you use integer with that x so the type of that function will be inferred to x uh, int return uh, getting int and returning int so it's it's statically typed but it can infer from the context the same uh, does f sharp so you uh, you don't Sometimes you have to. Sometimes the compiler cannot understand which uh, type it should be. So you have to specify it explicitly. But usually, usually, especially with record types, you don't need to do that. It's happening uh, just... Uh, you don't even notice how it happens. You can always see the type of that function or that variable. You always see uh, the inferred type. So it's not it's the the biggest dif it's, it's the difference that you see anyway the type at the moment of compilation you see the type uh on contrast uh, in Erlang uh, or in uh, JavaScript you don't see the type I mean it's it can be anything you can pass string to uh, where you expect a number and it will be implicitly converted and that sometimes lead to really crazy things. And we all know the, all the weirdness of, uh, uh, of JavaScript. Yep. When not to use. Um, I can uh, answer this way. Uh, functional programming, sometimes, sometimes uh, an algorithm, really uh, difficult algorithm, a very complex algorithm, will be more efficient in imperative way. So without recursion, without uh, those iterations, so the really with updating some local state in place. Yeah, sometimes that will work m more efficiently, like, yeah. Uh, but uh, I would encourage you to use languages, not, exp again, many languages allow you to work in both ways. And just, let's say F-sharp is focusing on functional way of doing things, but it also allows you to do mutations, you do imperative way. So, you mainly, like in most cases, you will use functional programming, but sometimes you fall back to imperative way, and that's fine. That's what uh, Haskell wouldn't allow you to do, as far as I know. So if you have a lot of side effects, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't recommend to use Haskell. And anyway, if you choose between functional languages, I strongly encourage you to use F sharp, like really, because it has a lot of um, background, uh, the background, at least .NET, .NET Core, cross-functional, uh, cross-platform, um, uh, super um, uh, it, it performant. Yeah, so I would, I would, uh, I would recommend F# -sharp all the time. Yeah, sometimes maybe, maybe you you could choose Closure. People like it. But that's another way of doing things, just a completely different thing. Yeah. Big data. Then Python is your choice. <laughs> Scala. Scala is too verbose, isn't it? Um, I, will, I will give some examples on the next talk of Scala and F sharp. Yeah, in some cases, in some cases, F sharp would be more verbose. I agree, but in mostly all other cases, Scala is too verbose, isn't it? But uh, but uh, yeah, uh, okay. That's the thing is, if you use big data, then you probably use some libraries. And for Python, we have a lot of a lot of libraries for doing that, don't we? As far as I know, but those are those are just libraries are uh, wrappers on C++ really efficient code. Okay, 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 okay. So yeah, big data, not machine learning then. Big data. Um, okay, but uh, again. 
maybe, maybe, maybe you're right. Uh, Scala, if, yeah, yeah. It, uh, if I would be from Java world, I would probably consider Scala. Yeah, uh, since I'm the, I've been a .NET developer, I don't know, for more than 10 years, then yeah, for me, uh, F Sharp was the, th the problem is that when you switch to another language, it's not only in syntax or something like that, it's also the whole, uh, the, the infrastructure, you need to know how to um, create a new project, which framework to use, and if you open, I don't know, uh, let's say Clojure, uh, there are several web frameworks. Which one to choose? You don't even know. But when you are um, in this world already, like I am in, in .NET, I al already know that there is, let's say, Kestrel, and there is ASP.NET Core built on top, and there is, there is Giraffe for F Sharp, just a wrapper to make it more declarative, more functional. And then there is Saturn, which makes it even more declarative. That's better for F Sharp, okay. But yeah, in C Sharp, I wouldn't use those frameworks, definitely. But at least I know that that's the, the core of that. And if I now switch to Java world to Scala, I don't know. I, I have no idea what's there. <laughs> Okay. Okay, thanks. Yeah, um, at the moment I'm not going to switch. Just to maybe uh, for my uh, for learning, for studying. Yeah, I would try to consider. But yeah, um, it's uh, at some point <laughs> I tried to uh, introduce Haskell uh, in my company, in my previous company, and I was told that there is no way in the nearest future you will get Haskell in production. But you can use F Sharp. And we had it in production, so yeah. Because everything was in .NET, and at least at least the same framework, yeah, the same CLR. That's it. No more, no more questions. I need to get back to to the last slide then. <laughs> Too much code. Yep. And then, thank you very much, Dikuyu. Uh, next talk is on the 22nd of October, F Sharp, uh, please come. If you want to reach out to me, just go to Mikhail.dev and you will find all my contacts there. So please uh, do not hesitate. Uh, just just uh, drop me a message if you have any other questions or suggestions. Thank you very much. <laughs>